So apparently the Funko Pop bubble just burst and I thought I would give my opinion on what's going on with Funko Pops and uh, really my overall opinion on how strong these headwinds may be against them given these uh, giant supply dumps into the landfill that are happening and just talk about the Funko product overall and how much I believe it in it as a collectible and also as a potential speculative collectible. Now this is in response to a reserved investments a YouTube video that just came out I believe today just a few hours ago. Now reserved investments is a great uh, collecting channel who really does a good job of giving a very bearish uh, perspective on a lot of these uh, collecting categories and sort of the market uh, discussion around these categories. So I really love the channel. Uh, just like I love Rudy from Alpha Investments channel. Remember, you know, you don't have to agree with everything everybody says um, on any of these channels. It's just a part of the discussion. It's great to have different perspectives. And I think ultimately um, the truth, and as in a lot of things in life, really does kind of fall somewhere in the middle. And uh, so, yeah, that reserved investments video, I'll put a link to it in the description below. It's 1 a.m. rant, millions of Funko Pops headed to the landfill due to mass-produced scarcity. And in the video, he's really giving a very bearish opinion on uh, Funko Pops and comparing them to Beanie Babies and also Pez, which have taken a really dive in their sort of collectible market value. Now, he is going over an article from Kotaku by Ethan Gach, uh, G-A-C-H entitled over $30 million worth of Funkos are headed to the landfill. So this sounds very similar to the MTG landfill dump thing that I uh, saw Rudy from Alpha Investments was talking about. And I haven't really uh, looked at too much. Uh, it doesn't really surprise me much with the 30th anniversary going on with MTG and just kind of the huge supply of modern products in general, even Pokemon. Remember all that news that was going around about how they were producing billions of cards. And uh, that actually hasn't really tanked too much of a uh, modern Pokemon, in my opinion, I don't think. Um, but yeah, there's uh, a little bit of that to be wary of with these recent products. Now, something that I think is uh, really interesting from the, the article by Gok, and again, I'll put a link to this article down below, was this uh, quote that uh, reserved investments brought up Funko's warehouses are overflowing with five inch chibi replicas of machine gun, Kelly, Spider-Man, Pikachu, and every other vaguely famous cultural icon and throwing them out will be cheaper than trying to sell them. So I guess there's all these costs with shipping these to different big box stores and uh, just kind of dealing with it. And for them, it's just kind of better to take them to the landfill and just dump them. There's that's somehow cheaper and better, I guess guess for the product in the brand. Um, I don't know. I didn't even know until all of this came out that Funko was actually a publicly traded company. I thought they were like uh, a, some kind of toy brand owned by like a Hasbro or a Bandai or something. But yeah, it'd be interesting to know like what other products they have to kind of help diversify besides these Funko Pops because I don't know. I mean, maybe it, it costs more money to actually uh, get these to bo bo big box stores rather than get them to a landfill. But is that really worth the uh, punch you're taking to the brand? Because there's going to be so much negativity around that. I mean, that's really going to kill, I think, some of the trust um, in the own company's belief in these products. So there are two things I really want to focus on is this initial thesis around uh, Funko Pops that uh, is, you know, kind of supports them as a strong um, collecting category that I actually think um, reserved investments might have gotten wrong. And then also just as general oversupply of Funkos and how we can relate that to the T, you know TCG space and other collecting categories as really the biggest um, thing for companies to be aware of and also consumers and people kind of messing around in the secondary market to really uh, take heavily into consideration because I think it's really one of the biggest issues um, at hand at the moment. So this thesis around Funko Pops, uh, reserved investments brought up that a lot of people are looking at Funko Pops uh, as such a strong category because they can connect to any IP, right? You got Harry Potter, Pokemon, all these superheroes from all these Marvel heroes. And, you know, if you're a Batman fan, um, he was talking about, you know, for his example, if you're a Batman, you're, you're going to want a cave, you know, your bat cave full of Batman stuff, and you're going to want the, the Batman Funko Pops, you know, the, the Batman 
uh, Pez and, you know, the, the Beanie Baby stuffed animals. I don't think they have a Batman Beanie Baby, but, you know, all those things, right? And that's kind of the thesis around Funko Pops is that it can connect with any collector of any IP and everyone's going to want the Funko Pop, okay? And I actually think that is a strong thesis. And actually, I think that Funkos are strong in that regard because you can have organic collectability around them, right? Now, I don't actually own any Funko Pops. I'll explain why. But I can understand, you know, if you're the biggest Harry Potter fan in the world and you've got your Harry Potter action figures, your trading cards, you got your posters and all that, you're going to want the, the Harry Potter Funko Pops, you know, and just the Harry Potter ones, you know, if you're just a Harry Potter fan, you just want the Harry Potter Funko Pops as a part of your collection. So I actually think that is probably happening and that should give a strong sense of organic collectability to Funko Pops. Here's the issue. In my personal observation, when I go, you know, I've seen like some of these YouTube channels, you know, some people are more minimalist collections, kind of more minimal with my displays and everything. But some people, you know, I've seen these YouTube channels where uh, MTG, Moxman is a good example. You know, they just have their hoard of stuff behind them. I um, you know, Alpha Investments has his shelf behind him and his channel. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's a particular style, right? You want um, your grails there on display that you want to kind of flex to everybody. And it's, that's nothing wrong with that. You know, collectors like to do that. We like to show off and share our stuff and then other people share their stuff with us. And that's a part of the community engagement. But when I see like Funko Pops in people's backgrounds or part of people's collections, I don't feel like, you know, when I'm, when I'm thinking about this just in a general sense, I feel like I don't see their whole collection of, you know, Harry Potter, their biggest uh, IP they love so much. And then those, Funko Pops just for the IP. When I see people with Funko Pops, I see a shelf full of like just Funko Pops or there are tons of Funko Pops just everywhere amongst everything. And it's very, very cluttered, right? And to me, that kind of lends an aspect not to the brands that Funko Pop, Pop is supposed to be an extension of and supposed to be an ancillary of. It, it's like people are just going after the Funko Pops themselves. And that to me is a red flag, you know, when you are going after a Beanie Baby, you just really like that animal. You love that cute one particular Beanie Baby or what it celebrates um, or is in memorial of, you know, the Princess Diana Beanie Baby or whatever. You just have people going after any kind of Beanie Baby, you know, for its speculative potential, trying to get all the Beanie Babies and just going after that particular thing. I really think a lot of collectibles have more organic and solid potential when they are a part of an IP that someone just is generally interested in. I think when you're just going after that particular item itself, that is a red flag for maybe a speculative bubble or something to just be wary of in terms of prices, kind of wait for prices to come back down. A good example of this is I think with video games. When you see people, you know, with their whole shelves full of every graded video game, they gotta have every grail there is, that's a red flag. For me, I like graded video games, but I only go after the ones with the IPs I love or the particular games I grew up playing. And a lot of times that's not a game that's going to take off in value that a lot of people love. A lot of times that's just a game that I really liked. And I understand that. And I'm willing to even overpay maybe going in to get that one thing, but I don't expect a ton of people going in to get that thing, right? That is, I think, a good example of organic demand. I don't need to have tons and tons of graded video games. I just want those few titles that are part of the franchises and IP that I love and that I collect and are part of that IP collection, not just the product itself. And that's also true for comic books. You know, I don't have to get every single grail of every hero, every comic book, right? I just want, you know, I grew up with Sonic the Hedgehog comic books, so I, I like graded, high-grade Sonic the Hedgehog comic books. That's not a big thing. There's not a lot of people going after that. It's very niche. And maybe there will be other people who kind of like that too, and that would be more organic and not hype filled or whatever. But so that's the issue. I think there's a problem with the understanding of this thesis and how it's applied. I think that thesis applies, but Funko Pops really are strong again in that organic collectability sense. When people will love Pikachu and they got to have a Pikachu uh, Funko Pop, that's that's great. But when you have someone not just getting that Pikachu, but then they're getting and not just the Pokemon, but they're getting all the other Funko Pops as well. And it's it's a Funko Pop thing, not a it's not an extension of that IP. That's I think can be something dangerous you have to be careful of. And when you see a lot more people doing that than just going after just their favorite character because they just want to have it as a part of their their little trophy room for that IP, that's a little bit different, right? You want to see a little bit more balance, maybe, because there's always gonna be a few speculators out there, but I think maybe one side's been a little bit tilted. And um, I think the real issue here is really not so much, again, the Funko Pops themselves. Products are great. I don't want to, you know, be negative on the products. You know, they're cute. They're cool. 
I think there's like Evangelion uh, Funko Pops, if I'm remembering correctly. You know, I like Evangelion. Maybe one day I can get one of those. But um, the biggest issue here, guys, I think that really people have been let down by the company. Companies are really letting down consumers with oversupply. I know it can make sense when you can sell a million units of something and they sell out and there seems to be more demand than that million units can fulfill. But then when you come back with 5 million or 10 million and suddenly there's not that much demand for it, you know, what happens to be able to absorb those units? Well, in this case, they couldn't, so they are just sending them to the dump, but prices would just have to keep dropping, right? And when you have something like that and you can't, don't have enough organic interest to really absorb that stuff and the speculative frenzy goes down, I think what happens is you really get a hit to the brand and that product, right? And I think that it's time for companies, this is with Funko Pop, this is with trading card games, this is with other collecting categories, to really embrace and appreciate what the secondary market does and what collecting communities, uh, their voices around a particular collectible do for your brand and for your product overall. You know, even if you have fewer products to sell and you get less revenue because you don't, maybe you had less supply than there was really demand out there. That's great. That means prices can go up in the secondary market. That means there's going to be news articles around your product. You don't have to come out and just flood the market as a result for short-term profit taking and then go home. That completely can sink uh, the product just entirely. So when you think about something like Disney Lorcana coming out, you know, that has the potential to be huge unless they just print it to absolute oblivion, right? Let them have a shorter print run. Sacrifice some of that short-term revenue. Let prices go up on the secondary market. Let people talk about it. Let the hype build up and then stay contained. Stay conservative about it. Don't keep flooding, uh, flooding things out. Keep the supply actually a little bit less than what you think the demand is. And then maybe it goes a little bit up and the, the market can handle that over time and stabilize. And then you can uh, readjust accordingly, but you can't have these big swings because when you get to the point where it's going to the landfill, that kills the product. That's when reserved investments, you know, he makes that the heyday video of, you know, I told you beanie babies. And really, I feel like, you know, I don't agree with him on the fact that everything modern can't be collectible, that you can't create out of the gate a collectible product. But I think that you have to believe it in a sense, you know, if it's going to be collectible and you want to be collectible, you really do need to be true to what you're putting out. And you need to let the secondary market and the collecting community really kind of make that product uh, uh, valuable for you rather than you try to do that through the sheer uh, selling of a number of units, because that is what's going to kill it. That's what I think killed uh, Beanie Babies ultimately. And, and sounds like what happened to Pez and could probably happen to Funko Pops, but not because guys, Funko Pops was bad to begin with, that it didn't have an organic thesis. I think it does. I do think modern products can be successful. You see it happening with Pokemon because they rein in those modern boxes and there's bearishness from people. You know, I'm not huge on modern myself because of the oversupply. And then when Pokemon, they balance that and they correct it and they just have real chase cards that are hard to pull. There aren't a lot of and people get this, you know, a reputation this of around modern as being something collectible and interesting. And that happens on the secondary market and people talk about it and they pump it up. And that's what sells more boxes in the future. I also think I'm going to put this in at the very end here, and this could be a whole video in itself. Funko Pops take up more space than trading cards. Um, comic books have a big footprint. But comic books are such a, a big medium. I feel like they can get away with it. People, even people who can, can, who are okay with having a giant stash of stuff in the corner of their room, space is limited. And, you know, at some point you've got to just turn down a product because not because you don't like it, but because you don't have room for it. Right. Um, I have a, a decent space, uh, in our house, but you know, my, my studio itself is not huge. And, you know, I've got, this is a, my nerdy man cave and, you know, I fill it up. But guys, I can't have my nerdy stuff just overflowing out of here into, you know, my 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 son's room and into our family room and all that stuff. You know, in, in our living room, we've got the china cabinet. That's got my wife's grandma's china in it. I can't be filling it up with 
Funko Pops or my training cards and, you know, my, my, all my, my nerd stuff, right? Just all around my house. You know, we've got to have artwork on the walls that's for grown ups and all this. I can't be putting up my anime posters and all that, right? So I've got, I've got to be efficient with my stuff. That's one of these reasons why I've been using vault services more and more because I just don't have room for it. Like you guys hold my stuff. I can't do it. Okay. Uh, so there's a footprint issue with Funko Pops. When you got the wall that's taking up your entire wall. You know, on a shelf, it's taking up all your shelf space. You got dust around that when you have a bunch of stuff cluttered together like that. And it just becomes a headache after a while. And storage is a real issue. And I think that maybe that's not talked about a lot. I haven't really heard people talk about storage with, with collectibles a lot. But I think that's a big advantage for trading cards because they're so small. And uh, I think it might be – I know Funko Pops aren't huge. And they're organic sense. You need to have a Funko Pop you know, and you have one or two, whatever the Funko line is for your IP you collect. And then that's it, right? But that's not what people do. They're hoarding up on them. They've got a ton of them. And then to top it all off, they've just been printing, making and making and making these things, it seems. And there's just so many. And uh, I guess if there is a, uh, a positive side to this, I think that with collectibles, you know, uh, Rudy from Alpha Investments has talked about how like 99% of magic cards are worthless. You know, like with trading cards, just find what is valuable in, in Funko Pops and form the community or, around those things. What are the limited ones? What are the ones that ter that are you can really talk about and go after? Maybe trade some of your ones that have a higher supply out for the more uh, interesting ones and let people get the mass produced stuff that they just want for their display that they just want cheap that they just want to have as a part of their collection and then just uh, don't worry about it. a lot of collecting categories a lot of comic books are mass produced I don't think you have to stick to always the old stuff I think it's a better bet but if you're going to get to new stuff you know you really do need to be careful that you're not paying too much that it really is limited that it has some other fundamentals um, to it besides maybe just being a Batman piece uh, that may help it stand out in the future. Guys, I hope you enjoyed my perspective on Funko Pops today. Even if you don't agree with it, that it brought you just one more perspective to think about. Uh, with this uh, ongoing uh, situation around Funko Pops, I know they're a force that will probably stick around, but will have some headwinds around it. It'll be kind of interesting to follow. So tell me what you think down in the comments below. If you got any uh, a good value from this, definitely hit the bu the like button. Help it spread to uh, other Funko people who uh, may not have gotten into my channel. I don't talk about Funkos a lot, but I wanted to put my perspective out there. Thanks so much for watching, and I will be seeing you all in my next one. Thank you.